What's the most important word in the Bible, do you think? What is the one word that defines everything from Genesis to Revelation? I know I believe that there's only one word from Genesis to Revelation that accurately defines exactly what God's relationship is with us and ours with our fellow man. And that word, my friends, is covenant. So in this week's teaching, I'm going to describe for you and dive into the nuances of the ancient Middle Eastern covenant versus the modern day contract. They are polar opposites of one another. Get it wrong, and we radically misunderstand most of the Bible. After all, the Bible's written from a old covenant perspective and a new covenant perspective. Misunderstand covenant, and we misunderstand the entire new covenant. So join with me as we go into all the weeds on this. It will revolutionize your whole mind on the Bible, but more importantly, on your relationship with one another and your relationship with Him. There is a tremendous power in understanding the real covenant that's found in the scriptures. I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries, and I'll see you there. Hello, everyone. Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministries, and welcome to today's broadcast. Wherever you may be found, whether you are in Canada or Mexico, South America, whether you're from sea to shining sea or over the seas, I am just blessed and grateful that you are spending this day with us. And so it is my privilege to dive into the Word of God with you today. Today, we are going to be diving into covenants and contracts. I know it sounds boring, but it absolutely is revolutionary for your life. Everything that you do revolves around these two words, whether you think so or whether you like it or not. And your understanding of these two concepts will dictate how you live your life. So. Let's dive in and let's get an understanding from a biblical worldview of what covenants and contracts really are right after this. All right, I am going to be your host for the next 17 straight hours. No, just kidding. We're going to dive into the scriptures. Let's see how long it takes us. I don't believe this is going to be a long broadcast, but you can look in the bottom right-hand corner and see how long I actually ended up going. But we're going to be talking about contracts and covenants, like I said, and we're going to start off with the word covenant. I want you to understand the biblical definition of covenant because in today's Western Greco-Roman society or modern uh, society at, at large, we operate under contracts, legal contracts. We don't have really much of a concept of covenant, even though most of us that got married, the pastor at some point talked about a marriage covenant. That's kind of like in one ear and one out the other, right? We don't really take the time to understand what that means. What is an ancient covenant? And so... Um, I, you know, I believe it or not, I just want to kind of disclose something to you. I already fully, completely recorded this video, and then the Lord interrupted it about 45 minutes in and had me completely change it all the way around. And so I was kind of going into the detailed part of, of the ancient covenants, and the Lord wants me to speak to you prophetically. There's some things that He wants to say about covenants and where people are at, His people are at right now. And I believe that what's going to come into this broadcast is going to be a special message just for you, just for the body of Messiah at large. And I'm not even 100% exactly sure what it's going to be. So stick around. Let's see what the Holy Spirit says. But first, let's lay the foundation so it'll make sense of whatever he wants to say by talking about what this actually looks like. So let's go to the PowerPoint and dive into the covenant definition. So the word covenant, I thought this was interesting. In the Latin, it actually means coming together. That's pretty cool that in the Latin, the word covenant means to come together. So in its fundamental simplistic form, covenant should bring the two parties together and not for a transaction. And we're going to talk about the difference between these two in just a moment. But covenant, true covenant, will always bring you together. So do you find yourself right now in a position where you feel like you are not together with your spouse or whatever you might have a covenant with? If you don't feel like you're together, then there's a breach of the covenant. And that is going to be a fundamental premise of what we're going to be talking about, ladies and gentlemen, for sure, without a doubt. All right. Uh, the second definition that we have over here is 
the actual Hebrew word, which is Brit. And Brit is uh, Beit, Resh, Yod, and Tav. And in the ancient paleopictograph, now I'm doing this on the fly here because I, I don't have no clue, but Beit literally means house, okay? Resh is the head, Yod is hand, and Tav means covenant. So you put that all together, what Brit actually means, it's the, it's the head of the house that has his hand to the covenant. Wow. I've never even seen that before till just now. So I'm learning that along with you. And that's pretty cool that the head of the house, the word covenant literally means to cut. And in the paleo Hebrew, it means the head of the house whose hand is in the covenant, whose hand is covenant. And let me ask you this, is your hand in the covenant? Is your hand all about the covenant? And so the word Brit, like I said, literally means to cut. And where they get that from is the word cut uh, in Hebrew. When you're, when you're talking about the actual um, covenant itself, they would take a, a bull or an animal and cut it into two pieces when they did a significant uh, uh, ceremony. And so we see this in Genesis chapter 15 with Abraham and God. God decided to make a covenant with Abraham. It was very significant. And in this covenant, he cut uh, an animal into two pieces. And then the flaming torch and the uh, and God in this this um, uh, um, uh, oven, uh, burning oven. I don't know what the exact word was in the scriptures. For some reason, it's it's uh, it's 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 missing. It's missing out of my brain right now because it's uh, it's ten fourteen when I'm recording this. Uh, but the burning torch and the in the oven, God Himself, Yeshua, really uh, pre incarnate, going through the covenant of the pieces while Abraham is asleep. And they are doing the walk of death, which is part of that ancient ritual Eastern covenant saying that may it be unto us the same as this animal if I break this covenant. And of course, we know that Yeshua took our place because we're the ones that broke the covenant. We deserve death. He took our place on the cross, took the death march for us because we deserved it. And he took it on his shoulders. So it means to cut. Something must be cut in order to have covenant. This is where circumcision comes from, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go back to the, the uh, PowerPoint here. And I just want to share this with you. I thought this was, you know, when I wrote this, I thought, man, I wasn't going to put this on PowerPoint, but I thought it would be worth you reading along with me. It says virtually all the religions of this world equate God's blessing and acceptance with self-righteousness. They treat their relationship with God like a contract. The problem is that the believer can never live up to the contractual agreement and therefore can never receive the blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear what that's saying? What that's saying is this, is that in, in virtually every single religion of the world, there is a contract and the deity requires the, the patrons and the servants uh, to do certain things for that deity under contract. And the reality is, is that no one can ever live up to the contract. It's not possible. This is, this is why the beauty behind the old covenant, behind the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the way down even into the Mosaic covenant, it was not a contract. A contract is a requirement that you keep all of the statutes and the, and the limitations and the commandments or else you're, you're not going to be blessed. There is no relationship. This is phenomenal. What the creator of the universe did was something that no other God had ever done. No civilization had ever thought of anything like this, which was a contract that was built into a covenant, the overarching umbrella of the contract or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the items that were inside of, of the, uh, of the marriage contract, if you will, was built on the foundation of a covenant and they're totally separate. They cannot coexist. And God made something that coexists where even if you break the contract, according to contract law, you're done. Like there's no contract, there's no relationship, everything is breached. 
God said, oh yeah, well watch this. You can take the bark off the tree, but I'm going to make a centrifuge root that goes uh, all the way down into the ground. And it doesn't matter how much bark you take off the tree. I'm going to maintain connection with the branches through the root of Jesse. And that root ends up being Yeshua, the Messiah, the one who took on the sin of all mankind. And he paid the debt that we could not pay, that the contract part of the law required that if you, if you sin or break the contract, you deserve death. That's what the contract said. But the covenant part of the contract said, oh, but I have the right to supersede the contract. I have the right as the, as the one who's holding the contract and the covenant, uh, uh, the, the covenant foundation stone, God says, Yahweh says, I have the right by my covenant because covenants are only as good as the one who is initiating it, the character of the one who's initiating it. So God says, by my own character, by my own life, by my own power, I have the right to give grace. I have the right to pardon. And that is true power, ladies and gentlemen. That is true power to be able to pardon someone and enter into, to override the contract. Let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper here. Let's go into the actual differences between contract and covenant. And then we're going to relate them to our relationships today. Because if you are having any kind of relationship problem, I'm telling you right now, I want you to put in the comments, which one of these the Holy Spirit highlights, and then that's what we're going to work on. Okay. So let's get into, let's get into contract versus covenant. All right, so contract versus covenant, here we go. On the left, we have contract. On the right, we have covenant. We're going to take them one by one, and here we go. First of all, contracts are based on mistrust, and they're based on limiting your own liability, while covenants are based on protecting the other person. I love that, you guys. I love the idea that contracts are all about yourself. It's all about limiting the other person. You know, in the old days, they did a handshake, right? And, uh, and, and your character, your character, the relationship was good enough. There was no need for contract because I knew that you, I would not make this contract. I would not shake your hand if I didn't know who you were. So relationship, that's not even a contract. That's a covenant. There was no such thing as contracts in, 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 in the old days, if you will. It was all about covenant. I trust you. And anytime there's trust, there's no need for contract because contract is built for mistrust. It's built for the fact that I need to know that if you break this, what, how am I going to be protected? That's contract. Covenant says, look, it's about protecting the other person. I'm shaking your hand. And when I do that, I'm becoming one with you. You see, that's the idea. If you ever had a nice, strong handshake with another man, there is a vibration that happens from that man to another man that says, I get you. I'm with you. I'm, I understand where you're coming from. Like, welcome. It's nice to meet you. We're on the same team. Now, it's been watered down today, but in the old days, the handshake was, was a symbol of achad in Hebrew, oneness. It's a symbol of connection. Okay. It's like male connection inside of that, of that handshake. Okay. So let's go back to this. All right. So contracts are mediated by the state. Okay. Wherever state you might live in or whatever country you might, they're mediated by a secular pagan society and judge. Whereas covenant is regulated by God. Now, how is it that covenant is related by God? How many of you that are married, you were at the altar and how many people were at the altar? How many people were at the altar? You have you, you have your bride, and then you have this man standing in the middle who is the reverend or the priest or the pastor, the one who's officiating the wedding. Now, what's fascinating, you may not have recognized this when you were 21 years old or however you were when you got married for the first time, but that reverend is, is in God's stead. He's standing 
in the place of God. That's why he says, by the authority invested in me, I now pronounce you husband and wife. That man has no authority to pronounce you man and wife for no reason. But under the God head, he is representing the creator and it's actually God by stead standing in front of you, which means that your covenant goes through God and then to your spouse. It's like the perfect triangle, right? You go to your spouse, not directly, but through God. This is really critical when you get in an argument with your spouse, because the last thing that you should do is go directly to your spouse. That's why the scripture says, if you have ought against your neighbor, <laughs> okay, you go directly to your neighbor, but no, your spouse, bad idea. And no, you don't go to your girlfriend first or your best friend and start talking about your spouse. No, what I'm talking about is you do what Moses did when he was offended. He hit the deck, meaning that he got on his, his hands and knees. He got God's perspective first. All right. And then, and then he went to the people. You need to get God's perspective first because covenants are mediated by God. You see in the state, yeah, someone breaches a contract. You, you don't go to that person. You go to the state right there. That's where that it's right there in the contract that there, there is a mediation clause or there's a litigation clause and there is outside litigators that will mediate that particular case. But in a covenant scenario, that's why I believe it's second Timothy says, don't you dare take another brother to court under almost any circumstance, because we're dragging the name of Christ through the pagan courts. He says, don't you have your own courts? Don't you have elders and wise people that can mediate your case on your behalf? Anybody that two parties respect for crying out loud, grow up, says God. And he says, start bringing your cases before wise people in my kingdom and, and let them adjudicate it and respect their wise decision. Don't take it before the pagan courts and draw, drag my name through it, right? So this is really important. They're not mediated by the state. They're mediated by God. Yahweh was there when you got married. So if you got a problem with your spouse, go to God. He's the covenant judge. He's the parent. Let me, let me, let me give you some, <laughs> you know, we, as, as people that have children and parents that have children, we get this concept significantly. You know why? Because when our children, one of my kids uh, has an issue with their sister, they go directly to us. Like it's all day Every day, if you got young ones, it, all I do is play judge. Like I'm Pastor Jim, and I am Husband Jim, and I am Judge Jim. That's mainly my role around here is making sure that my two youngest uh, don't kill each other. Okay, and maybe you've got the same in your house, and they they're best friends and worst enemies all at the same time. It's fascinating to see that dichotomy, but they come to us. The covenant that they have with their sister runs through us. They understand this concept that they can't change their sister. Think about this. It's deep. You can't change anybody. Put in the comments right now. I can't change anyone. I can't change anyone because one of the problems that people have, we naturally try to change people and you can't do it. And nobody wants to be changed. People want to be inspired to change, but they don't really want you to tell them to change. So put in the comments, I'm, I'm, I can't change anyone. Okay. So if you have an issue with your brother, with your spouse, go to God and complain to him. He's, he's absolutely more than capable of taking care of it. As a matter of fact, if you have a serious problem, this is for someone out there. If you have a serious problem with a brother or a spouse, get on your knees and I dare you to do a seven day covenant prayer challenge and it's an hour a day and you've got to get up before dawn or when it's uncomfortable and all you're doing is praying for your spouse. You're travailing in the spirit. You are warring for them. You're praying for them. Every part and everything that you can think of, you're thanking for them. You're praising God for them and you're praying for them. And I, I give you my word or your money back at the end of those seven days, if they are not absolutely transformed by what? your transformation. That's right. You heard me. You see, you'll start off praying because I've done this, by the way, you'll start praying for them and you'll be the one that's transformed in the process. They will see it and their transformation will come from your transformation. It's incredible how it 
absolutely happens. And it's so Christ. It's the God principle. Yeshua died on a cross, went into the grave, and was transformed into a new heavenly being. He was transformed in a blink of an eye. And his transformation was our transformation. When he was crucified, we were crucified. So praise God for covenants, because covenants mean that we're we're yoked with Yahweh himself. And if we're yoked with Yahweh himself, you know what that means? That means we can trust him because he's a perfect judge. He's a perfect judge. All right, let's go to number three on our top five. Contracts always have an opt-out clause where covenants are permanent. Let me say that again. Contracts always have an out clause. Covenants are permanent. So what do you want? You see, it's real nice to have a covenant because I know, I mean, contracts, because you can, your flesh can manipulate them. I know people that have manipulated their way out of uh, contracts by initiating uh, that opt out clause. They found a way to get out of the contract using the fine print because it's all about them. The contract was about them. Whereas covenant, it's all about the other person and it's permanent. There's, it is not designed to get out of it. Do you remember uh, when they asked him about uh, Yeshua about divorce? And he said, look, it, it, Moses, <laughs> he blamed it on Moses. I think that's actually kind of funny. Moses permitted you to have divorce because y'all just couldn't get along. You're killing each other. And so he, he found that it was wise under cer- certain situations to allow you to annul that covenant rather than have it's more serious problem like murder, right? Or other things that could happen that are, are abuse or something like that. So he permitted divorce, but what, look what Yeshua said. He said, but it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Now here's the deal. When we're dealing with, um, permanent covenants, God desires for us to come to a place where we understand this, that covenant, we go, this is why he says, do not be unequally yoked. If you're unequally yoked, it's like swimming with someone that is half as slow as you are, and you are in a race. They're going to drown you, not because they're trying, but because you're unequally yoked. Okay. If you are an oxen that is twice as fast and twice as strong as the one that's next, and you're yoked at the neck with that other oxen, you know what's going to happen? you're going to break that other person's neck or they're going to break yours. Or at the very least, you're going to be absolutely exhausted and that thing's going to rub you raw. Some of you are rubbed raw in your relationships because you've yoked yourself with someone that is not at the same place that you are. Covenant is serious. And unfortunately, we don't have any concept of what covenant is in America today uh, because people just get married all the time out of what? Contract, out of love, out of lust out of convenience, but not covenant. You see, in ancient covenants, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but there's nine steps to ancient covenants, right? When you, when you have an ancient covenant, you're exchanging not just vows, you're exchanging assets, you're exchanging liabilities, you're exchanging weapons, you're exchanging uh, uh, clothing, uh, you're, you're exchanging uh, blood. Like, this is a serious thing. As a matter of fact, that's where the handshake came from. They would mark blood on the wrist, and when the two men would 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 uh, hold hands, their wrist would come together like this, and they would share each other's blood, saying that we are now one flesh. This is the concept behind uh, Solomon and, and all these kings that would marry all these other, uh, the, the daughters of other kings, the princesses, would, would be married off to another king for what? For political purposes. Now, you might th- think, oh, man, that's a horrible uh, you know, downgrade of women. It's actually the opposite. The highest value in the kingdom was not gold. It wasn't silver. It wasn't slavery. It was a woman. A woman was the highest value in every kingdom. So much so, it was the only thing that would bring peace. So when another king gave his daughter to King Solomon, he's joining two nations together. And what did he use? He used a woman that joined two nations together. That's the asset of of understanding what real covenant is. Covenant 
is forever. Covenant is to bring nations together when we really, truly covenant with God. I'm going to make a statement here. I believe that we as Bible-believing Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, which simply is a, 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 a an ancient a Greek and, and Latin suffix that means Christ-like. If you are a Christ-like person, you're a follower of the Messiah. You know what our problem is? We don't understand covenant. Because we don't exchange weapons, we don't ha- we don't take we don't put down our weapons and take on uh, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit. Because we're so busy with weapons in our own hands towards one another and cutting each other up left and right and got to be right about this doctrine. And you're wrong about this. And my spouse is wrong and digging people here and digging people there. You can't e- you put down the sword of the spirit. You've taken the 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 shield of faith. And you're standing on it and the enemy is destroying every covenant relationship around you because there's one thing that the, co- that the enemy cannot cross and it's covenant. He can't breach it without permission or without you breaking a covenant restriction. He has, it is like the Lord of the Rings ring. If I can use that analogy, it is so powerful. The entire universe revolves around covenant. It was created because of God's desire for relationship, permanent, forever. It was meant to be forever eternal. Satan cannot cross the line of covenant. That's why you find a husband and wife that are hot and you will find more power in the universe right underneath God himself. God give the, gave the power of the universe and governing the earth to man and wife. And you want to know why the marriage is so attacked today in Christian homes? It's two reasons. Number one, we don't understand covenant. And because we don't understand covenant, Satan knows it's the most dangerous poison for his system. It's the arrow that will stick into the crack of his wall and literally create an earthquake that will shatter it to pieces like Jericho and it will fall one arrow of covenant coming from covenant love will destroy an entire city of darkness. The power of real covenant. My friends, get this. This will change your life. It'll change your relationship. It'll change your marriage. Men, stop being selfish. Stop being narcissistic and making everything about you. And women, if you fall into that category where you're making everything about you, stop it. We need to grow up in the Lord and let it go as I said in a recent uh, uh, vlog post, let it go and stay in praise. Get rid of all of the weapons. Take on the weapons of warfare. Put on the robe of righteousness. Exchange the blood. Where's the sacrifice in your relationship? If you're not sacrificing for your spouse, you have no covenant. You have fallen from the covenant into a contract. And when you fall into a contract, you're in enemy territory. And you have no protection of the Lord of the ring. The ring from the king. I'll never forget one time I, was, I, I, I fell into a, a night vision. I woke up to one of the most powerful visions. It was the first vision I think I ever had in my life. And it was in 1997. It was right when we were building our first house my wife was pregnant. We were living with my parents in a 110-year-old uh, bed, feather bed. And I had this vision where I was laying on my back and there was chaos everywhere. All these groups of people in this parking lot. And there were, every group was fighting. Every group was arguing. And, and, and I was just lying on my back by myself looking at the stars. They were beautiful. And it was totally peaceful. But everybody was arguing and fighting. All of a sudden, I saw this this, this like orange dot show up and it got larger and larger until I realized it was a fireball. And then I realized, no, it wasn't a fireball. As it got closer, it was actually a, a, a fire, uh, uh, like a frame of fire. And it was actually his signet ring. And on the inside of it was a Hebrew word. And I never heard of that Hebrew word. I never seen the Hebrew word. It was the very beginning of, I, I, it wasn't even the beginning of my, my, my the roots, uh, the Christian roots journey of my life. I, I, I didn't even heard of the, really the front of the book. I didn't understand anything that I understand now. I was just looking at this vision and it was a signet ring and it said uh, Aliyah on it. The, the Hebrew word Aliyah was in fire on this. And it was, which means to return. I'm coming home. 
And it was his signet ring. The most powerful thing in the universe is the ring of authority that the creator of the universe wears. Not the authority in the ring itself. It's the character, the one behind it, that's holding the authority that says, this is who I am. I'm coming home. Are you ready? And that's why the marriage covenant is so critical. It's built around the signet ring of God. It's a three-stranded cord and Satan goes after covenants because covenants are the only thing that matter in Satan's realm because covenants are made with God. That's how they work. Spiritual covenants can't be made with anything else or it wouldn't be a covenant. Covenant is always two parties and the creator. So Satan wants to pull that apart because once you have the creator involved, he can't touch it. That's why we need to understand covenants. Understand covenant, you put power back into your life. You put the power of the living God back into your life. Sorry, I get a little passionate, but this is important. Number four, contracts are mutually beneficial based on performance, whereas covenants are mutually beneficial, listen, through sacrifice. Did you catch that? Contracts are mutually beneficial based on performance and covenants are mutually beneficial based on sacrifice. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. That is a paradox of all paradoxes. It's a paradox of all paradoxes because you're saying there's mutual benefit if there's sacrifice. That's the opposite in, in contract form, which is based on performance. But in covenant, when I sacrifice for the one that I'm in covenant with, whether that be my spouse, my children, or whether it be Yahweh himself, when I sacrifice, what is sacrifice? I crawl up on that cross. I don't have to always be right. When I'm right, I'm wrong. When I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm okay with being wrong because to be wrong is to destroy and, and kill the ego. And the ego is the only thing that's between me and the cross that I'm supposed to be on right there because I'm supposed to represent Christ in my home. Husbands, your house is falling apart likely because you have an ego that's in between you and the cross. Wife, you have a husband that's not leading you, possibly because you have an ego. And he might make more mistakes than you, but I assure you, you probably have not come before the cross and said something like this, Father, I, I've been focusing so much on the dirt on my, of my husband or my spouse that I have forgotten that I likely have dirt under my own fingernails. Would you show me the crevices of my heart where the enemy might be hiding? If there's anything on my side of the street that I can clean up, please expose it. Because I have a covenant with you, not just with my husband. So I need to be right with you because his sins might be greater than mine, but I still have sins because all have fallen short of the glory of God in sin. And the wages of that sin, Romans 6, 23, is death. So let us, ladies and gentlemen, fall into a position of sacrifice. Think about this. In temple times, the way that the old covenant worked is that when someone sinned after the sin, listen, this is going to be pretty cool, I believe. After they sinned, there was a sacrifice and the sacrifice covered that sin. The blood was shed. The sacrifice was made. It covered the sin. That's the way the, the, the original covenant worked. Then God said, look, I, I, I got a problem here. They keep destroying the temple and I'm, I'm tired of the blood of bulls and goats. I never really intended for that anyway. So what I'm going to do is I am going to make I, God said, because I am the head of the covenant, not the contract. I am going to make a sacrifice myself. And my sacrifice is going to be the perfect sacrifice. And I'm going to do it before they sin. You see, this is unheard of. Even in contract law, when someone breaks a contract, there's a consequence. In covenant, you break part of the, the covenant uh, stipulations, there's a, con a, a consequence. God says, I said before you blessings and curses. Blessings if you keep my commandments, curses if you don't. Okay? So there's, there's consequences. But God said, I'm going to forego the consequence before there is even sin. I am going to pay the consequences. And here's why. Because he knew that one day there would not be a temple, number one. And number two, he wanted to reinitiate what was in the garden where we are the temple. 
And he wanted to create a perfect covenant that before you sinned, there would be no way for the enemy to accuse you to break the covenant. You would be held on by the string of blood, by the river of blood, I should say, straight from that tree on Calvary. That, that God would say, even in your sin, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love was so great that as a believer, when you held on to the horns of, uh, of the altar and you asked for forgiveness and you invited Christ to come into your heart, which some of you that are watching right now probably need to do, but when you accepted Christ into your heart, you got access to a covenant that you don't even understand the power of. That even when you sin, Romans 8.1 says, even when you sin, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. See, when you're in contract law, there's condemnation. When you're in covenant law, there's no condemnation. Now, I can walk away from the covenant. I can say, I don't want the covenant anymore. But as long as I want the covenant, and as long as I return to the covenant, and as long as I initiate the blood of the covenant, and I make sacrifice in praise, this is the power of the new covenant, ladies and gentlemen, is that the old covenant was based on a, re, a, 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 a post facto after I sin, make a sacrifice. And I better do it quick because I'm out of covenant. And in the new covenant, the sacrifice is already made. And so it's retroactive. All I got to do is initiate it through a simple act of repentance and praise. I must still offer a sacrifice. I cannot just sin, right? Romans 6, 1, I think it says, shall we continue to sin because grace will abound? May it never be. We shouldn't break God's Torah because grace is there. May it never be. He says, we need to maintain the position of staying in covenant with God by doing what the covenant uh, the commandments say that we need to do to love our neighbor as ourself and to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But when we mess up, we're supposed to do two things. We're supposed to repent of that sin, to shuv, totally turn 180 direction, the other direction. And then we are to sacrifice in praise. Now, if that sin happens to be with someone else, we're supposed to bring restitution, not say, I'm sorry only. That is American contract. I'm sorry. It's not biblical covenant. Biblical covenant, husband, is not to go to your wife and say, honey, I'm really sorry for that. I apologize. Will you forgive me? No, that's great. But where's the sacrifice? Where's the, where is the restitution? Because you stole a part of her heart. You, you, when, you, when you snapped at your child, you broke a little bit of that, little, that kid's heart. You, you made something happen. You created a small tremor in them. You need to bring restitution. See, if we brought restitution for everything that we've done to people, we would probably sin a lot less because the cost would be greater. Right now, there's no cost for anything but words. I'm sorry. And people know when you're sincere and they know when you're not. And they know when they can sense the emotion that you really feel bad. You feel broken. You can't believe that you did that. And sometimes that is alone the sacrifice that's needed to heal that other person's heart. You see, when you make a mistake in covenant, your responsibility, because we just learned that it's based on protecting the other person. So when you break a covenant, one, you're allowing the enemy in, and that will wreak havoc in your life. But two, you have to protect them, which means you have to bring restitution. You have to bring new bricks and rebuild that wall of trust. You can't just say, I'm sorry. The wall's been broken. The covenant ring has been breached. It's got to be re-welded with the love of God. Spend the time. Learn what covenant is. Protect the other person that you broke covenant with because they're bleeding from the inside out and you probably don't see it. Almost finished here. Last but not least, when a contract is broken, it's nullified. It's over with. It's completely breached. It's done. When a covenant is breached, we still seek to keep it because the covenant is with God also. This is so critical, my friends. This is so important that we get this because if we don't get this, if we don't fully understand that covenant is not about you, it's about you protecting the other person. And when they are weak, 
You're supposed to be strong. How do I know that? Because Christ said that. When I am weak, he's, he is strong, which means that in my household, I'm to be Christ in my household. So when, when my wife is weak and when, she, when my children are weak, I'm supposed to be strong. What is weak? Weak can be if you're in an argument with your spouse or, or in any kind of covenant or you're struggling even with, you must be strong. God, I can't, I can't handle my, 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 uh, my spouse right now or my kids right now or my job right now or my life right now. Lord, I give you my mind, will, and emotions, and I draw upon your strength for their benefit because my covenant with my wife or my husband is not about me. It goes through you. It's about honoring you in this moment, and I'm calling upon your strength for their weakness. I'm not going to poke at their weakness. I'm not going to expose them. I'm not going to mock them. I am going to be humble and recognize that tomorrow I might be in their shoes and I might be the one that's emotionally triggered and out of control. I might be the one that's losing it at the seams because I'm emotional or I'm hangry or I'm tired or whatever it might be. We're all just children, you know, with, with adult diapers that if we don't get fed, if we, you know, we got to go to the bathroom or we're tired, we just cry. We, we hurt people and we need to be long suffering. You know, I just did a, a blog post on this and we'll end here in just a moment, but I, I want to just encourage you. I did a blog post talking about long suffering. God wanted me to do long what? Uh, he wanted me to, ha- I, I always used to call it patience, but it, it, but it, the reality is, is that if an alien came down from outer space, he wouldn't have a clue what patience is. But if you call it long suffering, he gets it in every tribe, every tongue, every language, every continent throughout all the time, even a child understands long suffering. Why are we so absolutely spoiled? in today's modern Christian world that we have no idea what long suffering is. So when someone hurts us, we throw a fit. You know what that's called? It's called immaturity. We should know how to stay on our square. We should know how to not take everything personal. We should now I'm not saying that we, we can't get offended because people can offend us, but it needs to be through the lens and the filter of Christ. And the more that you are in his image, the more you will have long suffering towards your fellow man. So I just want you to write in the, 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 the comment right now, I will be long-suffering. I will be long-suffering. The next time you have a situation happen, I want you to verbally look at your spouse and say out loud, I will be long-suffering. I love you. It's okay. I understand. Your love for your spouse and for those that you're in covenant with should be so great. You know why? Because his long-suffering for you is great. His long suffering for me is great. And that's why we're not to judge. That's why he says, man, you better forgive. If you don't forgive, I will not forgive you. Everything starts with letting go, letting God, staying in praise, being long suffering, being in covenant with one another. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am starting this process of teaching you guys covenant because we're heading in a direction that the Holy Spirit wants to go. There is a global movement in the spirit of prayer. There's a global call that God is calling for his people to get into prayer. And they first must understand covenant. They first must understand that this, this thing that we have a relationship with God is not built on contract law. And for some of you out there that that are so into the front of the book and you're so into the commandments, that's great. But don't turn the commandments of God into a contract or you'll be turning Hagar from a servant into a slave master. You'll turn the Torah, you'll turn the whole front of the book into your slave and it will kill you. It knows nothing but to condemn those who break it. But if you keep it in its proper place as a servant, and you recognize that this is covenant, and covenant means relationship. Relationship means love. I'll tell you right now how you'll know when someone's in covenant and when someone's in contract. The contract person will be a terrorist online trying to fix everybody's problem. The contract person will be the one that's trying to point out everybody's faults. The covenant person will be the one that wants to restore them. The covenant one understands relationship. He doesn't want to hurt that person, doesn't want to humiliate that person, doesn't want to mock that person. 
because they don't, they're not in the same place or believe the same thing. One who's in covenant with God only wants to draw other people in deeper covenant with God. It is my prayer, ladies and gentlemen, that marriages will be healed because they'll sit down and they'll discover where are they making the mistake. We need to put down our weapons and pick up the weapons of God because we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against the principalities and powers of this present darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get in covenant with God. Something is coming and we're going to need to be on our knees, hands free with the sword of the Spirit. I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries. Please share this message with everyone you meet. I'll see you in the next video.